prioritize that, but because of the um, esteemed, very important presenter that we have with us, um, what, some people heard about it across town. So welcome to you if you're not from Mount Cross. We're so glad you're here. So this is the, I want to say, third or fourth in a series that our Reconciling in Christ committee has put on. Can you raise your hand, please, if you are on our Reconciling in Christ team? Okay, you can see Bill, who's at the camera, and Jim, and Jessica, and um, Becky. So thank you to our Reconciling in Christ team that's really been trying to listen deeply to the congregation as we are on a journey um, to discern whether or not to become an officially welcoming and affirming congregation to the LGBTQ plus community. So um, one of the things that our team heard was the need to really explore this issue in scripture. So I could not be more delighted to welcome Father Patrick Mullen to be our guide looking at this issue through scripture. And we will have a formal introduction of him in a second, but I just want to say he was my Greek professor. <laughs> yes, um, the Episcopalians let me not drive so far to Claremont for at least one class, which was Greek. Um, and now, congregation, how many times do I use my Greek out loud in a sermon? You can be honest. Daily. 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 They're lying. Um, so, but you taught us that. You said in your preaching, don't be quoting Greek too much. That's not what the people are interested in hearing. So um, that's the reason that you're not hearing it. Okay. Um, a, a wonderful friend, a wonderful priest, a wonderful pastor to the whole Camarillo community and beyond. So thank you so much for being here. Uh, Jim Dingus, would you read the formal introduction? Yes. And Pastor, or Father Muller, please welcome. We're very pleased to have you here tonight and thank all of you for being part of this most important evening. Um, just a little bit kind of on the formal um, biography of pa Pastor Mullen. Um, his presentation is entitled, Seeking Understanding, a Deep Scriptural Drive into Same-Sex Relations. Father Mullen moved first to Camarillo as a seminarian in 1977, same year I came, escaped Chicago weather and came to Ventura County as well, and has been assigned here the uh, 39 of the last 46 years. He was ordained a Catholic priest 38 years ago, and in 1985 for service for the people in the Archdiocese of Los Angeles, and he's been a pastor at Padre Serra for the last 13 years and served two decades as professor of biblical studies, as Pastor Julie indicated, uh, New Testament uh, at St. John's Seminary in the Graduate Division. He received his PhD from the Graduate Theology Union in Berkeley, where among his happy memories was assisting the Greek Summer Initiative for students of the Pacific Lutheran Theological Seminary. Pastor Mullen, welcome. I, am I live? I don't think I'm live. Are we? There we go. There we go. Excellent. Oh, good. Good, good, good. Well, it's a, it really is a pleasure to be here. It, uh, uh, ever since uh, that Greek class, uh, we've had little chances to conspire with one another on things. Pastor Julie has come to give. She, you gave an entire uh, weekend's retreat to our women's uh, group at Padre Serra. And I will never forget their description, maybe she's used that here, of the life of a woman. And she was describing all of the things that a person does as she was pouring water into a bowl. And you know, we're taking care of the kids, and uh, we're, uh, we're, we're working full time, and she keeps pouring water, and, and uh, uh, life is very full, and our husbands are demanding, and then we've got our parents to take care of, and the bowl starts overflowing. Did she do that with you? It was just such a wonderful image, and uh, uh, the women brought it back to me, and I, th I, I beg, borrow, steal, that's, a, that, you know. Anyway, um, it's a, a pleasure to be here. Now, uh, uh, let's, let's be honest right up front. This isn't an easy question, and 
Uh, I don't believe in easy answers or, or, or uh, a slide over the top. Are you willing to, to do a deep dive? Did you bring Bibles? We have Bibles in the pews. Bibles in the pews? Okay, very good. All right. Because Catholics come to Bible studies without Bibles, so I'm glad that... <laughs> I'm glad that you guys are on top of this. I am very comfortable with questions. There are going to be some obvious breaks for questions. We do have, uh, where do we have them, uh, Bill? We do have some, some papers uh, so that if, if you feel more comfortable writing a question down and submitting it, uh, just give, uh, uh, can they hand them to you, Bill, or who should they hand them to? Oh, you'll collect, okay, 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 so, all right, so, so, so feel free, you know, if it's, a, if it's a question that you'd like to ask, you know, towards the end, write it down and, and, and submit it, it's, that can be easier. I am comfortable taking questions as I go, so if you have a question that's pertinent right for that moment for what I'm saying, go ahead and raise your hand, and when I come to an obvious conclusion, I'll call on you, all right? So we're going we're to do this a couple of different ways so that uh, I don't move on too fast uh, if there are things that you need clarification right on that spot for. So go ahead and raise your hand, and uh, at an obvious moment, I'm going to stop. And, and also, if you need restrooms, just go to the restroom. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> the mind cannot embrace what the bladder cannot endure. All right. So it's not my job as a scripture scholar, to prove anyone's theology, Catholic or Lutheran. That's not my job. I have no obligation to support your predispositions. It's my task to discover both what the original authors would have intended and how their readers would have read it. All right? That's my job. And then we have to ask the question after we figure out what that is, if that has anything to do with our lives and the questions that we're asking, right? Sometimes people use scriptures, use the scriptures to prove a point. That's not what I am going to do here. We're going to try to uh, uh, unpack what's going on underneath things. And uh, scripture scholars, we need to be uh, general practitioners on a lot of different disciplines, archaeology, linguistics, uh, uh, biblical languages, et cetera, et cetera. But we all choose a discipline that is the one that is closest to our heart and our greatest interest, and mine is cultural anthropology. I'd like to get into the cultural world that produced the text and ask, in that world, does knowing their circumstances change the way we read things? It inevitably does. All right? So, so that's, that's, my, that's my, my starting point. All right? So... Uh, when uh, we, we have uh, uh, handouts here, uh, what I would like to suggest, if you are a note taker, uh, all the scripture passages that, that I'm going to be referring to are written down. So if you are an actual additional note taker, just put, uh, if, for example, if I'm reading, talking about Deuteronomy 29, that's number 2F. Just put 2F on your notes and then go from there. You know, that just is easier than trying to put anything, any more information on this very a dense page, all right? So that's just uh, the system for you. Now, what can we do? Not as much as we want because there are, it, would, it would be, I think, about two and a half, three hours for me to do what I, you know, when I began to do this. So we're going to have to be selective, all right? And I'm sorry about that, but I have a lot of passages for you to read in full if you, if you have a passionate interest and want to do or need to do that for the sake of your own conscience, okay? Now, I am aware that some of you saw Matthew Vines in his video. Uh, I, I, I watched about two-thirds of it just because I, I knew you, uh, some of you were going to be watching uh, For the Bible Tells Me So, hermeneutics and the debate about LGBTQ plus inclusion. He strikes me as a fervent, intelligent, kind of fun uh, uh, speaker, not a biblical scholar, and many of his conclusions are correct, but not all. And so uh, we're, we're going to do a, just a little deeper dive on a couple of the places where he skimmed a little lighter. Uh, there are, if we look at things as they are used by people today, at least three principal places in the Hebrew Bible and three in the New Testament 
that people are using to make a statement one way or the other. Uh, the first Old Testament passage, which is where we're going to begin, is the portrayal of the relationship between Jonathan and David. Jonathan, the son of King Saul and David. Uh, that did come up in Matthew Vine's discussion. The second one is the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah and what implications that has for us. Now, on these two, we're going to skim lightly. I'm not actually going to read all of the passages that I've listed there because we do not have time. And I'm going to say fundamentally, they do not change our minds, OK? Uh, on that first one with David and Jonathan, what I'm going to say is this. David is never lifted up in terms of his sexual romantic relationships as an example to anybody. And all we have to do is look at poor Bathsheba and Uriah, who dies as a result of David's inability to handle things correctly. So even if the case was that David and Jonathan had a relationship, nothing about that would suggest that it was either right or wrong, OK? Because David himself does not handle that element of his own life well. Now, the reason why it gets pulled into the discussion is because the word that is used to describe the relationship between them is ahav. That word means in Hebrew, he loves. And it is used for romantic relationships. But it's also used for friendships when people love each other deeply. And it is also used to describe the way God feels about God's people. So it has many non-sexual uses as well. The trouble with Hebrew is that it has a very constrained, small vocabulary. And they have to use words to cover many things. It's not like English, where we have blue, and then we have azure, and then we have indigo. You know, we've got all of these words for blue. It'll have just one word, OK? And it has that one word. And it does get used to describe the relationship between Jonathan and David. The interesting point for us, I think, is the Deuteronomistic history that describes this relationship was written somewhere 300, 350 years after the events described. And then another 350 years or so after that, it gets translated into the Septuagint. And this is by Greek Jews in Alexandria trying to make sense out of the Hebrew text, but they're all Greek speakers. They translate the text into Greek, and every time the word ahav is used in the description of the relationship between Jonathan and David, they translate it not with erao, which is the Greek word for a romantic sexual relationship. They use the, the, the verb that you have probably heard some form of agapao. You, you've probably heard the mispronunciation agape. The, the correct pronunciation is agape. All right, yeah, agape. Uh, so they don't translate it with the uh, romantic terminology. They use the deep committed relationship translation words. So the Jews of the ancient world did not conceive of it in a romantic sense. Then there is the why was that story included at all? And I'm going to say, it's being written during the reign of King Josiah. And it's incredibly important to him. His legitimacy as a king has everything to do with him being a descendant of King David, exactly. Now, the trouble with King David is he's not the first king. Josiah claims a direct father-to-son relationship going all the way back to David, but David is not the first king. The first king is Saul, who's of the tribe of Benjamin, not Judah like David is. And there is this break between Saul, whose son is Jonathan, who should have been the heir and the king. There's a break, and David becomes the king. And the whole purpose of describing their relationship in the way that it is, is that if David became king, it wasn't because he was competing with Jonathan. He was Jonathan's dearest friend. All right? So it's actually propaganda. The whole relationship is propaganda, not a moral lesson. 
Now, does it bother me that someone who was gay wanted to look upon that relationship with, ro uh, with a romantic lens? It doesn't bother me at all, but that's not actually the point of the text, okay? So, does it help you making a decision about where you're gonna go as a parish? I'm gonna say no. Fundamentally, it doesn't, all right. Uh, uh, by all means, if you'd like, read all of those, those passages that I've got listed there, and they will, they will use the word love. They will also use the word covenant. And the word covenant for us, am I moving too far forward? Oh, I will. All right, well, I'm sorry about that. They also use the word covenant. And we all use the word covenant for marriage, do we not? Back then, bereath, covenant, wasn't used about relationships between husbands and wives. It was used to describe the relationship between overlords and underlords. There is that moment in Genesis 15, I, uh, you perhaps will recall, where Abram cuts all the animals up, splits them in two, and then there's a fire pot that moves through those. That's actually a covenant ceremony, and usually what would happen would be there would be an overlord, a king or an emperor, and an underlord, someone who was subject to him, and the subject lord would have to cut up the animals, and the subject lord would have to walk between them saying, let it happen to me as has happened to these animals if I am unfaithful to this relationship with you. It's a dominance ceremony. And God, who topples everyone's expectations, doesn't send Abram through those animals. Abram was the underlord. When they make this commitment, it's God and the flaming fire pot that moves between those animals. It's an absolutely spectacular moment that makes great light of the crucifixion. It's not we who die for our sins, it's Jesus who dies for our sins. What begins with Abram ends up with Jesus in this consistent history of God breaking into our lives to save us from our enemies and, when necessary, from ourselves. So we begin to use that word covenant, which was the dominating word in its original use and would have been at the time when Jonathan and David were using the term. The underlord would have been David. Yes. The under... The under the, the, the less important than political figure, while Jonathan was alive, was David, all right? But it was a dominance thing, not a mutual uh, uh, celebration of commitment and, and, and love and permanence. We used it for marriage now because we have seen how God operates. And what, we, what we're hoping for is that in our relationships with one another, we can act like God does, okay? So when you see the word covenant, don't be thinking marital covenant in terms of Jonathan and David. It's not, it's a dominance relationship. When you see the word love, don't be thinking romantic. Be thinking this is a deep friendship and understand it's political and propaganda. David didn't topple Jonathan. It was tragic how it ended and David was dearly moved at the moment when Jonathan dies. Okay, any questions on this? We're content. We're content. Okay, let's move on to Sodom and Gomorrah. And again, I really encourage you, read all of these passages that I have listed in your notes if it's a matter of importance to you. But I'm going to summarize very quickly why this is not helpful for what you are trying to do here. The critical moment is when Lot has welcomed these angelic visitors into his home and others come seeking to basically rape those, those visitors. Uh, so this is not a story about committed gay relationships, is it? It's a story about power, and often enough, that's what rape's about, power. It's a story about, if you want to call it gay rape, you may, but it's definitely a story about rape. It's not a story about relationship. And so fundamentally, it's not what you're talking about at all either. And it was, it was never understood as primarily an issue of sexual relationships because Sodom and Gomorrah get brought up repeatedly in the Hebrew Bible, in the Old Testament. And I've got the passages listed there where it happens, and I have uh, uh, taken out just the key things that Sodom and Gomorrah were being criticized for. So in Isaiah 1.10, in there in 2E, 
They had shed innocent blood and wronged the orphan and the widow. That was the sin. In Deuteronomy 29, worship of false gods and idolatry. In Isaiah 3.9, it's abuse of the poor and the needy. In Jeremiah 23.14, adultery, lying, and unrepentance. In Ezekiel 16.49, it's pride, gluttony, complacency, disregard for the poor, and abominable crimes, which are not uh, uh, clarified. In Wisdom 19.13, it's hatred of guests, which is inhospitality, and the enslavement of those guests. Uh, it gets mentioned several other times without clarifying what the problem is. Moving into the New Testament, in 2 Peter 2.6, it's licentiousness, which might apply here, but lack of principles. In Jude 6 and 7, where it's the closest we might get to something that seems sexual, they pursued other flesh. Regardless of what your text says, the literal translation underneath it is they pursued other flesh, by which they do not mean men, they mean angels. Yes. And they make a deliberate reference to that passage in uh, uh, Genesis 6, one where the, uh, the giants uh, desired, uh, saw, the, uh, saw human women and, and, and desired uh, to have sex with them and lost their place in the heavens. They desired other flesh and lost their place in the heavens. So the, the issue here isn't the gender thing at all in Jude. It is that they wanted something that was angelic to which they were not entitled. Okay? So does the Sodom and Gomorrah uh, passages help you make your decision? I'm going to say they do not. Now, they're going to be used. The word Sodom has become the defining term for the sexual relationship between a man and another man. But that's really not what the passage is about. There are a whole list of crimes, and the thing that is most interesting when you read this is that God is aware of the crimes of Sodom and Gomorrah before he sends the angels. He's aware, but that's why he sends the angels, because all of these other things that we've just read through have been going on there. And in the conversation that Lot has with these angelic figures, they say, we've been sent to destroy it. It's all, the decision has already been made. It was made before the, the particular uncomfortable, confronting moment at Lot's door ever happened. All right, so I'm just going to say, that's as much as we're going to say about this. Any questions on Sodom and Gomorrah? Are we content? Are we at peace? All right, now we're going to have to dive in. So get your Bible. We're going to turn to Leviticus here. So get your Bible and open it to Leviticus 18.22. Because here we're going to have to slow down quite a bit because this, act, this what we're going to have here, matters quite a bit for what Paul is going to do with it, all right? Now, as <laughs> Pastor Julie said, I have told my students forever, do not use a lot of Greek and Hebrew because uh, it overwhelms and, and it's not impressive to people who are trying to figure out how to live their lives. But here we're going to have to do some work. Are you willing to do a little bit of work in Greek and Hebrew? I will try to make it clear as I go through, all right? Um, Paul, in his vice lists in 1 Corinthians and uh, uh, 1 Timothy, uh, is going to use some Greek terminology that we're going to have to trace back to these passages here in Leviticus, in Leviticus 18. So, if I say Septuagint, the Greek version, do you know what I'm talking about? Okay, no. All right. By the second century before Jesus, most Jews spoke Aramaic. In, if they lived in Palestine, they did in fact speak Aramaic. But most Jews did not in fact live in what we think of as Palestine or Israel or Judah. Most lived in the diaspora. And in the diaspora, the Jews spoke Greek. And the Hebrew texts had become unavailable to them. It didn't, uh, uh, they, they, they couldn't understand them. So they had made a translation between the third and second century BC. They had made a Greek translation. It's called the Septuagint. You can ask me later about why. It is the text overwhelmingly used by the writers of the New Testament who were also writing in Greek. So when they quote the Old Testament, it is almost always, not, not, not always, but almost always, 
the Septuagint that they are quoting. Okay? So, we're going to be looking at Leviticus 18 and 20 from the Greek perspective because that's what Paul is going to have used when he writes his. And there are two words that are going to come up in both Leviticus 18, 22, and 2013. And these words are arsenos, the word for male, and koitein, the Greek word for bed, but it comes to mean sexual intercourse. Koitein, our English word coitus, comes from it. It originally meant bed, but so arsen and koitein. Those two words occur in both of these passages. So literally what we find in Leviticus 18.22, and with a male, arson, you will not lie in sexual intercourse, koitein, as with a woman. It is an abomination. Okay? Then in Leviticus 20.13, go ahead and, 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 and shift there. Leviticus 20.13 is going to be a little bit more expansive. We actually think that the author intended to expand it. Whoever lies with a male arson in sexual intercourse, courtain, as with a woman, they have both committed an abomination. Let them be executed. They are guilty. All right? So those two words occur in both of those passages. And the, uh, the judgment of it is that it is repugnant. Bedelegma. It is repugnant. It's when, uh, that word has when you've got a visceral reaction to it. When something is disgusting, uh, you open your trash can and the maggots have gone to, to heck and with whatever you've thrown in there, and you feel that, that, gut, that visceral thing. Well, that's what this word is describing. Okay? So it's very strong language. And, at least in the second passage, a deliberate call for the death penalty. Sounds serious, doesn't it? Now, having said that, not everything that the Old Testament calls repugnant is considered repugnant by us. And I give, and it's the classic example, but it is the effective one. Leviticus 11.10, I'll, I'll read it for you. You don't need to switch there. Stay here in uh, 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 Leviticus 18. But in Levit Leviticus 11.10 it reads, but of the various creatures that crawl or swim in the water, whether in the sea or in the rivers, or all those that lack either fins or scales are loathsome to you. What are they talking about here? Lobster. Shrimp. Crab. Yeah, shellfish. Bottom feeders. They eat dead things. And God is the living God. And things that eat dead things are repugnant. You do not eat them. All right? Now, have any of you eaten lobster? Or shrimp? Or crab? You have done something biblically repugnant. I just, say, I just point that out. It is not the case that because the Old Testament calls it repugnant that necessarily we consider it so. All right? So, uh, then the death penalty is also <laughs> applied here. and That seems very serious, but, but we also don't apply every uh, death penalty that the Old Testament encourages us to do. For example, uh, in Exodus 35, 2, on six uh, days work may be done, but the seventh day shall be sacred to you as the Sabbath of complete rest to the Lord. Anyone who does work on the Sabbath day shall be put to death. And they actually used this passage against Jesus, who does on the Sabbath. Yes. And, and he's going to be just fine with that. Now, there's the interpretation of what is work and, and, and what is the, the purpose and intents of, uh, of Shabbat, of the, of the day of rest. But there are things that are repugnant in the Hebrew Scriptures that we do not consider repugnant, and there are things that have death penalty in the Hebrew Scriptures that we do not apply. And we have to have a reason for that, don't we? What I'd like to suggest is, for the most part, there are three distinctions that we need to be aware of. One is the world of morality. When the Old Testament speaks about morality, we largely take it seriously, all right? When it speaks about worship, we largely don't. You're not concerned about the temple in Jerusalem, are you, liturgically? No. 
It's not a concern for us. And they had another part of their religious life that we abandoned completely because of the teachings of Paul, and that was their concern for ritual purity. All right? In their world, God was the living God, and anything that resembled death, like leprosy, looked like decay. The shedding of blood. Blood is sacred. It's the, issue, it's, it's the very essence of life. Uh, animals have to be slaughtered in such a way that the blood is drained for them. Menstruation causes a problem because there's loss of blood, which meant loss of life. Uh, sexual intercourse, uh, after sexual intercourse, there's this diminution in terms of life's energy. It feels like you're a little dead. Uh, anything that was remotely connected to death had to be set aside, and you had to bathe yourself and perhaps do a sacrifice, depending on how serious it was, before you could enter into the presence of the holy. Okay? Now, Paul says all of the exercises that they did there those were the works of the law that Paul says, you know, we never did them well enough. It's always been a source of condemnation for us. That's Paul's, going to be Paul's argument. And we're completely bought into that. We do not observe any of those things. There are just a few that had, you know, um, a few lingering presences into the medieval years, but for the most part, they're all set aside. So we're not bound to those. We're not bound to those. And we, uh, so we're not going to focus on we are going to accept the things like the Ten Commandments that are purely moral, okay? So the question is, when they're saying here, a man shall not lie with another man as with a woman, it is an abomination, they, shall, they are clearly guilty, they shall be put to death. Are we talking about morality or are we talking about ritual purity? And that's the rub here. Because it's in chapter 18, with a lot of other passages that are, are, that are clearly about sexual morality, and that would suggest that it is in that realm, but there's a clear, a, a clear and puzzling absence. If you had read through this whole chapter, the thing that you would notice that is absent, it says with absolute clarity, men lying with men is repugnant. It says nothing about women lying with women which is a very curious absence. Because when on the other morality questions, there was a balance between, okay, here's what happens when the man does it, here's what happens when the woman does it, and, and, and it bounces back and forth like this. For example, a man rapes a woman, uh, if it happens in the city and she does not cry out, she's to be put to death along with him. If it happens out in the countryside, she could scream all she wants, no one would hurt her, we're letting her off, but he's gonna die. All right, but they discuss you know, point by point, the male-female thing, all the way through this until they get to the question of man lying with man, and then they say nothing about women lying with women. That's a puzzling departure. So what I'd like to suggest is, yes, semen is defiling, but not in a ter uh, horribly ter uh, terrible way. Let, let me uh, read what, uh, what they have here. Ah. Leviticus 15, 16. When a man has an emission of semen, he shall bathe his whole body in water and be unclean, but just until evening. Any piece of cloth or leather, leather with semen on it shall be washed with water and be unclean until evening. If a man has sexual relations with a woman, they shall both bathe in water and be unclean until evening. So semen defiles, but not in a horribly terrible way. But what happens, and excuse me for being a little graphic here, when we pile the semen of one man upon the semen of another man and put it in anal intercourse and mix excrement into it. At that point, we seem to have crossed a line that they can no longer stomach. But I'm going to suggest this isn't about morality, it's about ritual purity. Okay? So, it talks specifically about a particular male behavior. It doesn't say anything about relationship, does it? No. And when it addresses that particular behavior, it doesn't address it in a balanced way. It does not include women. I am of the mindset that it is the ritual purity question of semen piled upon, semen piled upon excrement, reaching a critical load, a, a point where the meltdown happens, and they just say, no, it's repugnant. You can't do it. Put him to death. All right. Now do you have questions? Does anybody want to write a question down? 
this, this one might be too awkward to actually ask. All right. Uh, so it, it, if, if you need to, uh, get, a, get one of those papers and, and, and write whatever question you're down there. We, we, can, we can take care of them a, a little bit later, all right? I do not want to leave you in the dust on this. And if you have outraged commentary, if you need to shake your fist at me, go right ahead. All right? All right. We, we, can, we, can, we can deal with that. So we're going to shift now from the Hebrew scriptures, because we, we've really dealt with the three that matter. I know that uh, uh, our, our, our young man, what's his name again? He, he, uh, he included the story of, of um, uh, Ruth and her mother-in-law, uh, Naomi. And, and I don't think there's anything sexual there at all. In fact, Naomi helps Ruth uh, uh, achieve a relationship with Boaz. She's, she's, her, she's her, her, her wingman to get her related, uh, married to Boaz. I don't, I don't think that there's a, a sexual relationship there at all. And then he also mentioned the centurion and his boy. The word pais means boy in Greek. And yes, sometimes, sometimes, uh, well, well, we'll talk about great Greek relationship men with boys. Uh, but that's not the word that they would have used for the boy that they thought of as their lover. They would have used the word eramanos, the, the, the sexually beloved one, eramanos. So, uh, I'm not going to deal with either of those because they really have nothing to do with the questions that you're asking. So where we are going to turn is to Paul on this question. And the key to this is 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Please turn there. There's a neologism. That's a technical term for a word that occurs for the first time. We live on the West Coast, and living on the West Coast, the uh, teenagers are famous for coming up with fun new words and using old words in new ways. And, uh, well, Paul has his moment here, it seems. Uh, so let's start at 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and do read along with me, and be patient, because we're going to have to take it word by word. Uh, what translation do we have here? Do you know? Are these NRSVs? NRSVs. Okay. Um, all right, so I, there, are, there are three texts that I'm going to bounce back and forth with. The one that uh, we use uh, in the Catholic circles is the New American Bible Revised, which in some ways is very parallel to the NRSV. And now that we have the NRSV UE, which, uh, so these three are the ones that I'm going to bounce back and forth between, okay? So, do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be Deceived. That's the uh, New American Bible revised. All right. So neither, what does your word say next? Fornicators? Okay, yes, that's the NRSV. The NBRE says the exact same thing. The NRSV UE says the sexually immoral. Okay, they've, they've uh, changed just that little bit, the sexually immoral. It's the, the word is pornoi. Our word pornography comes from it. And it applies to any sexual deviancy of any kind. So it can mean, among other things, um, fornication, prostitution, adultery. Now, we're not going to uh, include adultery as a meaning for the word here in this place, because two words later, we're going to have the exact technical word for adultery. So, so people who are sexually um, uh, active in any number of ways, so be they fornicators, I th I'm kind of partial to the NRSV UE, the sexually immoral, because that's broad, and the word pornoi is broad, okay? Then our next word is idolaters, correct? Then we have adulterers, correct? Now that is the word mo moikoi, that, and that means a, a, a adulterer, adultery, so the, the pornoi does not include it because he's got it ex explicitly right here. Now just to be clear, it's a different world. What does adultery mean in this world? It's when a man has sex with another man's wife or betrothed. A married woman or a betrothed woman having sex with anybody is adultery, but it does not include a married man who has sex with a prostitute. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Very convenient. Yeah, very convenient. That's what it meant. And it, because the, the bottom line was always inheritance. The bottom line was always inheritance. 
That's the critical thing that they're, they're battling for. They want to determine for certain that the uh, inheritance which goes through the male line, that his family's property will not be given away to someone else. Now, he can have offspring that receive nothing. They're okay with that. But other people's offspring cannot get his, his family's possessions. So that's what it's about. It's an ugly world. All right. So the next word, what do you have after adulterers? Male prostitutes, yes. The NAB says boy prostitutes. Uh, but both the NRSV and the UE say male prostitutes. The word is malakoi, and we know what this word means. It means uh, soft in a general sense. So it could mean the, the nice uh, soft material that your upholstery is made out of here. Applied to a woman, it's a fine attribute. Applied to a man, it meant that he was effeminate and probably sexually used and was used for that group of boys that prostituted themselves out to older men, okay? Prostituted themselves, took money for it, okay? So Malachi, we know what it means, and so either boy prostitutes or male prostitutes, that's a fine translation for that word, okay? Uh, the next word after uh, boy prostitutes or male prostitutes, what do you have? Sodomites, yes. And uh, the NAB and the NRSV put sodomites, but both of them put a footnote to explain. Do you have a footnote underneath? What is your footnote? Uh, uh, the, 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 no footnote? There's no footnote in the Oh, okay. In your study edition, it's going to say, meaning of this word is unclear. <laughs> okay? And both the, uh, the NRSV and the NRSV UE say the meaning of this word is unclear. Because what we have here is those two words, those two Greek words, arsen and koitein, smushed together into one word, arsen koitai, and this is the first text that survives to this day that uses that word. It does not occur in any other earlier Greek text, at least that survives to this day. All right? So when we have a word that's a debatable term, what we always do is we go looking for it everywhere we can and say, OK, in this context, it seems to imply this. In that context, it seems to imply this. What we have is nothing. Now, that doesn't mean that Paul invented the word. It could have been a word that's coming from Jewish circles in which Paul circulated, and none of their literature survived because of the destruction of Jerusalem or some other reason. We don't know where the word comes from, but it occurs for the first time in human history in a text existing to this day in this text. So how are we supposed to understand it? Do you see a problem here? All right. It is a big problem. And so this is the text that's going to cause the greatest amount of harm, I think. So the King James Version translates it as abusers of themselves with mankind. Darby uh, translates it as those who abuse themselves with men. The American Standard Version, abusers of themselves with men. So they're all in that King James Version lineage. But the word abuse is not found in the, these words at all. It's men having sex or having sex with men. It's very hard to know. But the word abuse is not in there. So I'm going to say all three of those translations are very questionable. I would discard them. Then we have the, the International Standard Version and the New American Standard that simply says homosexuals. English Standard Version, men who practice homosexuality, and NIV, homosexual offenders. And I'm going to dismiss this one. Can you guess why? Any use of the word homosexual is going to be incorrect in any Bible at any point because it has a technical meaning which no one at that moment in history could have understood. The word homosexual means someone who has an orientation to members of the same sex. It's part of who they are. 
That as a concept begins in the 18th century AD. We cannot take an 18th century and subsequent idea and impose it on a first century text. So the one absolutely out of bounds translation is any one of them that says homosexual or those who practice homosexuality because that is an orientation that is innate, all right? So we're going to set those aside. Then uh, what are our next ones? So, so the NABRE, the New American Bible, uh, uh, well, l let's, let's put this in the context of Greek culture. So in Greek culture, mm -hmm. there was a practice and it was normative among the well-to-do, in many places, not all, but in many places, where older men would foster, in a sense, 12 to 18-year-old boys. The relationship was meant to be a mentorship. It was meant to be a kindly relationship. It was overtly sexual. We would call it Grooming is a good word. Ephebophilia, pedophilia, depending on the age, you know. Uh, we, we would have a term for that practice. Now, it was normal and frequently commented upon. There were some Greek cities where it was, it was not acceptable, but in a great number of them, it was the normal way of, of initiating a boy into manhood. Now, it was not acceptable in Greek circles for adult men to have relationships with each other. But this relationship was written about with great frequency. All right. Now, in our text, we have Malakoi and Arsenikoitai. We have boy prostitutes and men who have sex, Arsenikoitai, right next to it. What I'd like to suggest is what Paul seems to be indicating here is among those who will not make it into the, uh, the kingdom of God are the boy prostitutes and the men who have sex with them. That Paul seems to be condemning here ephebophilia, uh, pedophilia, grooming, the whole, that whole relationship that was so common in Greek circles. All right? That's what I would like to suggest. And I can only do it because of the context of those two words side by side. Now, how prevalent was this how acceptable was this idea? Well, um, Zeus was notably unfaithful to his poor wife, Hera, with any number of human women, but also with his cupbearer, Ganymede, in Greek. The, uh, the name for Ganymede in Latin is Catamitis, Catamite, all right, boy prostitute. All right, that's the head of the gods. And then you've got Apollo. And Apollo has about six boys, human boys, that he has sexual relationships with. So you have the practice with the men and the boys in the cities backed up by the behavior of their gods in the heavens. So Paul is taking on Greek culture here. Who is he writing to? Corinthians who are right there in the middle of uh, th that whole mix of things. And, and, and Paul is taking them on. So I'm going to make the case that uh, there, there's, there's nothing in 1 Timothy 1.8 to help us one way or the other. I, I, let me read it to you, because the same word arsenikoitai gets used there. We know that the law is good, provided that one uses it as law, with the understanding that law is meant not for a righteous person, but for the lawless and unruly, the godless and sinful, the unholy and profane, those who kill their fathers or mothers, murderers, the unchaste, pornoi again, sodomites, the NIV says, arsenikoitis again, uh, kidnappers, liars, perjurers, and whatever. So it, it, we have no context in the First Timothy passage to help us un unpack it at all. We just simply have this word. This is a later text, probably not written by Paul, probably written by one of his disciples, and it uses his name because that was the correct way to uh, uh, give um, credence to the origin of the source of material. All right? So these two passages in Paul's writings, I'm going to suggest, 
are not going to help you because is there anybody seeking to join your community who is seeking to establish a relationship with a boy as an adult male? I, and I'm going to suggest that when that happens, you be as angry as is appropriate, all right? But I think that is what these passages are referring to. All right, questions. Well, Greece, Greece, okay, uh, uh, what happened to ancient Greece? Ancient Greece was, by the time of Paul, already defeated by Rome, okay? Uh, one of the things that happened were the, the Greeks were in a religious crisis. Uh, their gods had failed them. Athens was supposed to be defended by Athena, but she had failed. The Romans had conquered them. Uh, Artemis was supposed to defend Ephesus. Artemis had failed. The Romans had conquered them. So the Greeks went looking for some gods that would work for them. They looked at the Roman gods and recognized that the Roman gods were their, just their gods with new names, you know. So those, were, those weren't any good. The thing that happened to the Greeks was that Christianity came along, and there was a god who broke into history not to rape you, but to save you. It was good news. It was a completely different approach to faith and religion. It really was good news. We're so used to hearing about our loving, good God. Well, we, we, we can't ever hear it the way they heard it because it was such a strikingly novel idea for the Greeks. The Greeks took to Christianity hand over fist because uh, the, uh, it offered something of substance. Philosophically, the, the, the idea that there was one God was so, so appealing. And Judaism was appealing too, but they had to get circumcised and wanted to not eat bacon for breakfast. So. Anyway, Christianity became... Uh, so so the, the, the Greeks become Christian is what happens. And part of it is because they're a conquered people looking for something that's going to feed and nourish their spirits. Well, I think there was a lot of cultural melee before that happened, too. I mean, kind of rocket from inside. Well, I'm not going to comment on that. Uh, that's, uh, uh, that that's entirely possible. Yeah. Yes? I'm having a little bit of trouble, and I wanted to ask for clarification yes. on the use of the term homosexuality. Right. Mm -hmm. same sex, right. Uh, but you said there was no reference to that in the times that we're talking right. about right now. Exactly. So when there was same sex relations, are you saying that it was simply what was accessible, what was pleasurable, what was fashionable at the time, that you, we do not feel as though the men participating in this Maybe actually yes. had the desire or, or were homosexuals as we know it, that they were just doing it out of lust and not out of anything else? No, their, their percentage of homosexuality was probably parallel to ours. What was different was their understanding of it. The understanding was that everyone was obviously oriented to the, the other sex. And some people didn't act on their correct uh, uh, attractions. Some people defied their correct attraction. Can that happen? Yeah, I think, it's, that's, I think that's possible. But, Yes. They truly believed that everyone was heterosexual. Exactly. That was their presumption. So it's a different presumption than what we have. I'm having a hard time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well. Because they're seeing it in every single day. Like, we see it in every single day that it never occurred to them that this was... Well, when it reached adulthood, when it reached adulthood, they saw it as shameful. It was something that they accepted between men and boys. It wasn't something that they accepted between adult men. Was it financial inheritance problem, political? Like no, no there's, there's no inheritance problem when men have sex with men. There's no babies. <laughs> <laughs> no babies. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. Well, just a big mm -hmm. part of that would have been because they wouldn't recognize the homosexual aspect of things because it was hidden. Well, Please, please observe that virtually every culture sees itself as normal. Whatever it is that we do is normal. Mexicans see themselves as normal, and they think that we are interesting. <laughs> Just like we think they're interesting. But they perceive themselves as normal. Now, when the norm is heterosexuality, 
who gets to decide that there is an alternative? <coughs> See, the, 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 they knew the norm. And yet it didn't actually develop as an idea that there was something constitutional until the 18th century. Well, we've lived in a world where it's so normative to consider that, that we can't conceive of a world where that's not the case. Was the oppression of it, and I use that word just as a challenge, it's a fine word. of it based on the threat to the family unit, and that they didn't want to recognize that it was happening all around them? What was the threat that they were... Okay, what is the... What is the obvious? It doesn't have to be threat. What is the obvious thing that a child is supposed to do when adults get together? When you go into someone's house, what is the obvious thing that your child is supposed to do? Stay out of the room. Out of the room. That is unnatural behavior in a Mexican circumstance. In a Mexican circumstance, that child, if it's a well-behaved child, will go from one adult to the next, shaking each adult's hand, because that is correct behavior. You have described something that is unnatural. And, and see, that's what I'm saying is, it's hard for us to figure out how they can be so different, and yet they were. And that's the defining thing here, is they did not seem to have a consciousness. They never describe it as an orientation. They describe it as behavior that is correct with one spouse or with a boy, or that is incorrect with another man. That's how they describe it as correct or incorrect. And it's because, uh, what, what are the, what's the percentage of uh, homosexuals in general? It's, it's debated, tw oh no, no, it's much lower than 20. It's somewhere between four and, uh, four and seven, I think is what they're saying. Uh, so it's, it's, they're always gonna be a small percent, and they're not gonna be the ones who get to make the rules. It's gonna be the majority that get to make the rules and define what is normal. So they have behavior that they consider, that other people around them consider Yes. 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 A culture. Yes. Waspy culture. Okay. Um, so that's that's what I'm hearing is that it was it was cultural, almost. It, it is always going to be cultural. It's always going to be cultural. We cannot escape our culture. And when people begin to act in ways that offend our culture, we respond pretty firmly. That's the human response. And it has a lot to do, I think, with our hunter-gatherer years. We had uh, 100,000 years where we w had these small little groups that wandered, about 30, 35 people. And it, you were either an insider or an outsider. And the outsiders were always a threat. Well, this is why you're here. Yeah. Because that's your experience. Yeah. To me, in yeah. my perception, I yeah. can't speak for everybody. Yeah. It's, it's, we don't understand. We don't understand. We want to understand. Exactly. And, 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 and it's why I said at the beginning, it's not my job to defend your presumptions. You did say that. I did. <laughs> I did. Yeah. It's not my job to, to affirm the presumption you walk into the room with. In fact, it may be my responsibility to challenge the presumption you walk into the room with, with a different worldview. And their worldview when it's their scriptures, is the one that has to be the starting point for conversation. Because when we imply what we think, we end up with homosexual in the text. Can we help doing that? Yes, with a lot of study. With a lot of study. All right, I'm not sure that I got the question. What determined it in the Christian culture? What dictated the correctness or incorrectness within their culture? Oh, what, what, what dictates the correctness or incorrectness in the culture? Was it the Christian scriptures or was it something else? Well, Christian scriptures is going to become a very strong cultural factor, but it is not in the first century. The, the New Testament it doesn't exist as a collection yet in the first century. It's going to actually take a couple of centuries before it gets collected and, and uh, defined as a thing in itself. But it begins, to have, it begins to have more and more weight because early Christian communities begin to define what can be used there, what can be read 
when the community gathers to pray. And they begin to define canon lists, uh, things that, that we allow these things, and, and they actually compare notes. Uh, that's what begins to determine that. And so the more authoritative the New Testament becomes, the more influence it's going to have on culture. In the first century, all Paul has is his own persuasiveness. And he is a fairly persuasive guy. He's fairly successful among the Greeks. Not so among the Jews, but among the Greeks, he's pretty successful. So the thing that's going to determine it in the Corinthian culture is how persuasive they read Paul in competition with the world that they live in. And it's hard to change your culture. It's hard to change your culture. No. Okay. So if I could, uh, because I think it gets to the core of it, we're building on each other's questions. Yes. That was these, are great, these are great questions, by the way. My, these are the questions. That was the mm. question that I had going in. Why was it determined that people who, in our modern times, were homosexuals would not be accepted into the church in the first place? Why haven't, why haven't they been a part of our church all this time? Why are we now having to make a decision? Okay. So that's, that, that's a great question. And just for the sake of the people who are on, on the... Uh, why, why hasn't this been understood better all the way through? All right. Because what we have is a text moves into someone else's culture and there is a new word. What do they do with that new word? They define it. A new word moves into someone else's culture and they define that word. And what happened between the, the writing of Paul and the acceptance of things. This word is not used very often. It, to, to, to the best of our knowledge, the, ne the next time it occurs is in the second century in a letter from First Clement, in which he is simply quoting First Corinthians. Yeah. So that's the second century. And then we have a little window into it when it gets translated into the Latin of the, uh, the Western church it gets translated as uh, those who are bed partners with men. Okay, and that's in the fourth century. All right? So, but each new group, if it's a new word and they've got no context, they provide their own meaning. And that's going to be the dilemma. We do it too. We do it too. And it's part of the crisis because we read a text and the text has been translated, and it says very clearly in my text, homosexual. That's why we have to do the underground work here. So along the same lines then, going back to Leviticus. Yes. Now it's too embarrassed to ask the question. Um, it, it got a little awkward. <laughs> Issue of ritual, ritual purity. Ritual purity issue. Mm -hmm. What is the distinction there? Okay. All right. Oh, it's, 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 it's an absolutely... I, well, I, I, I wrote my dissertation on this. I'm trying to condense it. <laughs> the, the bottom line is this. Israel had a completely, wonderfully new relationship with its God. For the most part, the ancient peoples did ritual sacrifices to propitiate their gods, to feed and nourish their gods and keep their gods at a distance. It's like the Chinese saying, there's chaos in the heavens, the gods are fighting among themselves, that's when everything's okay with us, because when they're not bothering us, that's as good as it gets. Their whole sense where the gods were to be propitiated and fed and nourished and kept at a distance. The Jews had this remarkably different sense that it was their responsibility to host God in their land. And the temple, in particular the Holy of Holies, was God's footrest on earth. And if they kept God comfortable, the rains would fall, the herds would grow, the crops would grow, the people would flourish, their enemies would be defeated, everything would be wonderful. But if they offended God in the land, God would leave. The rains would not fall. They would starve. They would die. And the way they did this was to keep death at bay. Because God was the, 
you know, I, yes, Christian, fill in the blank. God is, and we would say love, would we not? That, that, that would be what we would say. But if you asked a Jew in that pre-Christian world, God is, they would say the living God, as opposed to the dead gods, the non-gods. He is the truly living God. And death had to be kept at bay. And so the whole ritual purity construct was, if you were going to enter into the temple precincts, you had to be ritually pure. So anything of death had to be kept away. Leprosy looks like decay, all of that. So if you read through Leviticus and Deuteronomy very, very carefully, everything that they prohibit in terms of ritual purity, it's all of something to do with death. The thing that defiled you more than anything else was the human corpse. Okay? Hence the whole discussion at the death of Jesus and the uh, attempts to, you know, uh, um, prepare his body for death and the attention that was given to that and the detail that was given to that because they're still operating in that world. Paul comes along and he says, you know, we never did that purity ritual stuff very well. We've had hundreds of years where we've been conquered by someone else. We've always failed. Why do you want to make the Gentiles do it too? Okay, and so you've read uh, Romans and Galatians. That is his argument. From start to finish, you don't have to do those uh, uh, ritual observances. They don't get you anywhere. They use, those are the works of the law that Paul so resoundingly uh, spoke against. Okay, they, that's what those were, which is why we don't know them. Now, if one is ritually defiled, they're not sinful. You see, there's the puzzling thing for us. They're not sinful unless they do it deliberately and then walk into the presence of the holy. That would be punishable by death. Okay? So. All right. How are we doing? I'm chewing on it. Chew. All right. And, and, and think, and we can take more questions at the end. Okay? All right. Anybody else? All right, so what we're going to do is now we're going to move to our final passage. And, uh, and it's going to have an interesting anthropology. It's, it's Romans. So please turn to Romans 1, 18, because you're going to want to read along here. Now, the Romans are different than the Greeks. Do the Greeks, excuse me, do the Romans allow for male with male sex? They're, they're different than the Greeks. Uh, the Romans specifically were against this man-boy thing. But they had no problems at all with a man with a slave, a male slave. Okay? So it's, it's, it's an interestingly different world. It's an interestingly different world. A man with a slave was fine, uh, uh, but uh, a man with another free man, no. A man with a, bo a free boy, no. A man with a slave, fine. Do whatever you want with a slave. So it's a different world. Now, what I do not know is how much Paul would have known of Roman culture. He grew up, he was born in Tarsus, as uh, we, we learned in Acts of the Apostles, and grew up there. He was very familiar with, with uh, uh, Judean culture because he was educated there. I'm not sure that he knew much about Rome. It, it's hard for us to know. But, it, it, but it, it, here's what he's going to say about this subject. The wrath of God, 118, is indeed being revealed from heaven against every impiety and wickedness of those who suppress the truth by their wickedness. For what can be known about God is evident to them because God made it evident to them. For ever since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes of eternal power and divinity have been able to be understood and perceived in what he has made. As a result, they have no excuse. For although they knew God, basically from the created world, they did not accord him glory as God or give him thanks. Instead, they became vain in their reasoning and their senseless minds were darkened. While claiming to the wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for the likeness, and here we're going to talk about idols, of an image of mortal man or of birds or four-legged animals or of snakes. Therefore, God handed them over to impurity, and here he uses that term that he's been so against everywhere else, but he uses the term here. He, God handed them over to impurity through the lusts of their hearts for the mutual degradation of their bodies. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and revered and worshipped the creature, the, the idol, rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Now, 
uh, the Romans and Greeks had idols that looked like human beings. The Egyptians had, were the ones who had the, the idols that looked like uh, uh, animals and whatnot. Um, uh, do we have idols? Green paper. Green paper? <laughs> okay. Money. Oh, 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 yeah, oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> Uh, small plastic cards. I, I, yes, yes, absolutely. I, I was going to say here, search for status, the preoccupation with power, the personal enslavement to the pursuit of wealth and possessions, uh, our fiercely dedicated worship in the shrines of the cell phone and the iPad, you know. Uh, these can be our modern idols. Ask yourself, though, either the ancient idolatry or the modern, are they the, the, the root cause of current homosexual orientation? No, but that's his anthropology. That's his line of argument. That's his anthropology. Where does this interesting line of thinking come from? Because he's going to go on. So, so be, be thinking of that question. As, and therefore, God handed them over to degrading passions. Their females exchanged natural relations for unnatural. Fusi king, kresin, natural for para, fusin, fusin. Our word physics or physical comes from this word uh, nature. Okay? And the males likewise gave up natural, you see, and here we have it. They gave up natural relations with females and burned with lust for one another. Males did shameful things with males and thus received in their own person the due penalty for their perversity. They gave up. See, Paul doesn't have any understanding that they actually had an, actual, uh, an, an initial orientation to members of the same gender. He sees them abandoning a nature. Okay? And choosing something else. So, um, now, the link between idolatry and this behavior. Uh, did the Romans and Greeks have sexual acts that they did in their worship? Not generally. But there was a very clear link to this among Jews. Who were their primary competitors on the religious scale? What, when, if you read through Kings, where is it that the kings are always heading off to that makes the, the prophet really furious? They're going up to the high places, the Asherah. The god was Beelzebul, and the ritual acts were to get Beelzebul sexually interested and to expend, again, here we're going back to it, semen, which was rain, which would fall down upon Asherah, the female receptive goddess, which was the world, which would, because of the rain, come to life. Did they use sexual practices? Apparently they did. Were the kings of Israel often interested in those sexual practices? Apparently because they are regularly uh, excoriated by the prophets for having participated in them. So was there in a Jewish mindset a connection between idolatry and perverse sexual practices? Yes, there was. All right? And Paul brings it right into this discussion here and makes it the root cause for male-on-male, female-on-female relationships. Now, again, I'm going to say it is entirely possible for people to, def to defy their nature and to behave in sexual ways that are in contradiction to their natural inclinations. But when a person walks into Mount Cross and they have someone that they're sharing their life with and it's, it's a member of the same gender, is idolatry the thing that is moving them to that relationship? I'm going to say, no, that's not the explanation. Paul's anthropology is where we have the clearest indication that his own understanding of human nature is that we're oriented towards the members of the opposite sex, and that's that. Some people choose to defy that nature. Now, let me ask, is it in fact nature? In 1977, a group of um, UC Irvine professors out on Anacapa Island, our own island right out here, discovered that some 14% of the birds were raising eggs that were fertile, which meant that at some point someone had sex with a guy, but they were paired female to female. And they not only raised this uh, clutch, they continued and remained mated for the rest of their lives. 
that some 14% of the seagulls out on Anacapa were having female-female relationships. Now, subsequently discovered that that whole thing with DDT that caused the whole terrible problem with the eagles and everything was having the same problem with seagulls, and the eggs that were most affected were the male eggs, which means that there was a superabundance of females, and when that superabundance went away, then behavior became a bit more normal. But once the question got thrown out there in 1977, how can there be female-female mated seagulls with the presumption that this just didn't happen in nature? They began to look for it, and where did they find it? Absolutely <laughs> everywhere. So when we talk about nature, fusin, it's happening all over in nature. All right, um, in an article in Scientific American uh, entitled, Why is Same-Sex Behavior So Common in Animals? This is in, in 2019 in Scientific American. They, they say, same sexual behavior can include, and I'm sorry, we're gonna get gra graphic again here. Uh, for example, mounting, courting through songs and other signals, genital licking or releasing sperm, and has been observed in over 1,500 animal species from primates to sea stars, bats to damselflies, snakes to nematode worms. When we talk about nature, nature's more complex than we might have thought. So, what am I going to conclude? Unless we are fundamentalists, and we're not fundamentalists here, are we? Are we, are we? Okay, good, all right. Uh, uh, do we hold the authors of the book of Genesis responsible for knowing the Big Bang Theory? We do not. Darwin's theory of evolution, we do not. Even the future, we do not. Unless we are fundamentalists, we don't hold biblical authors responsible for including, and they do, historical mistakes. There are mistakes of history in the scriptures. There are geographical errors in the scriptures. Do we hold them responsible for that? I'm going to give a Catholic answer, and, and this will probably resonate, and you can tell me otherwise, okay, Pastor Julie? Uh, from a Catholic perspective, the scriptures are inerrant in things necessary for salvation. That, uh, that things that actually matter for salvation, there, there's not going to be an error. Is history necessary for salvation? Is geography is science. The answer to that all is no. Is it, does that sound? Yes, that's right. Lutherans, how are we saved? By faith. Through faith. Okay, all right, okay. So, so having said that, if we, if we are, are, are going to ask ourselves how to handle this thing here, uh, it would be wonderful if all of human nature was understood by the biblical writers. But to the extent that sexual orientation defies even our ability now to find reasons for the differences we see around us. Is it nature? I mean, when I'm talking about homosexuality, is it nature, nurture, biology, or rearing? We don't know. Is it caused by a burst, burst of estrogen while in the uterus? That's one of the theories, but it hasn't been proved. Is it all in the brain? It's possible. We don't know. If we can't figure it out, how can we expect them to have? Having said that, people who are LGBTQ, they still have to live. And they hunger to love and be loved and have every right to be every bit as squirrely about sexuality as the rest of us, all right? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, here is the bottom line for me with these texts. The writers of the New Testament could not have perceived what we would say is constitutional in the orientation of either men to men or women to women. They couldn't have perceived that as a constitutional element of who they were. They describe it as an abandonment of their nature, a defiance of their nature to choose something other. But if you talk to someone who is gay or lesbian, that's not their experience. Now, bi is, a, is, is another thing, and that's a whole another rich uh, 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 thing for, for unpacking. Uh, but when they talk about their own experience, they don't have a choice. 
which is something that the scriptural writers could not have understood, did not from their culture, and then cannot be held responsible for providing us answer for the questions that we have today. Because we don't have people because of idolatry or crazy cultic practices looking to be members of our church. We have people who are moral people. I looked at that young man in that, that, that video. He's a good guy. He's trying so hard to hang on to his faith. You know, and he's looking for answers, and he's trying to provide answers for other people so that they can lead a moral life a, 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 in a committed relationship where things are, 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 are Christ-centered. That's what they're hoping for. That's not what Paul is describing here. Paul is describing a different world with a different set of problems. He's not answering our question. And that's my conclusion. Paul is not answering our question. Leviticus is not answering our question. And the people who today are coming to us looking to belong to our communities, they shouldn't have to bear the weight of the concerns of ritual purity of the Jewish world or of the thebophilia and pedophilia of the Greek ones. They shouldn't have to bear the weight of that because that's what that world was responding to. Okay? So then where do we turn when we're trying to make a case for either accepting or non-accepting? So... What I'd like to do is to suggest the starting point is always going to be the behavior of Jesus. So please turn, if you would, and don't make any presumptions while we're going to read this. Matthew 9, 9. Make no presumptions about where I'm going. It's the call of Matthew. 9, 9. It might be good for you to place yourself in the passage while we're reading it. See from which place you're viewing the story unfold. Where are you standing as we read this? As Jesus passed on from there, 9-9, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the customs post. He said to him, follow me. And he got up and he followed him. While he was at table in his house, Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat with Jesus and his disciples. The Pharisees saw this and said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? He heard this and said, those who are well do not need a physician, but the sick do. Go and learn the meaning of the words, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Now, as I'm inviting you to picture yourself in here, I do not mean to imply that the LGBTQ community should be placed among the sinners and tax collectors. I mean that we should see ourselves among the tax collectors and the sinners. Can you confess that you need Jesus? It's where we belong. The, the, the people who've got their act together, they don't need Jesus. We recognize that we need Jesus. So, it's the forever story, and it's built right into the New Testament. It's who Jesus surrounds himself with. During the ministry of Jesus, in Mark 8, 22, the disciple Peter chastises him when he speaks of dying and rising in Jerusalem. Get behind me, Satan. Peter usually only opens his mouth to exchange feet. And even, and even after the resurrection, he will be chastised by Paul in Galatians because as Paul says in Galatians 2, 11, Peter was clearly wrong. Peter's screw-ups don't stop with the resurrection. Jesus will call some or all of his disciples people of little faith four times in Matthew's gospel, whereas in Mark's gospel, it presumes that they have none. In Mark 10, 35, James and John, when they asked to be on the right and the left of Jesus, who have been Jesus' constant companions? Who went with him uh, into the house of uh, Peter's mother-in-law? Peter, James, and John. Who went up for the transfiguration? Peter, James, and John. Who did he want with him, next to him, when he is uh, preparing to die? Peter, James, and John. Who's always listed first? Peter. So when they ask to be put on the left and the right, what are they asking about Peter? Bump him. <laughs> this is such a nasty moment in Mark's gospel that Matthew rewrites it and makes the mother of James and John responsible. Anyone can forgive a mother for being ambitious for her kids, but that they should have asked for it themselves in Matthew and Mark's, and in Mark's gospels, excuse me, completely unacceptable. But that's who his disciples are. That's what they're like. 
And G in Mark 8, 14, if you have not read it, you should read it. Jesus is so despondent with his disciples that he has a little meltdown. As late as the ascension in Acts 1, 6, they're still asking if he's going to restore the kingdom. After the resurrection, they still think he's going to kick out the Romans. They don't get him. They don't understand when he talks about the kingdom of God, he is not talking about booting out the Romans. As late as that. So what I'm saying here, Jesus kept working with this set of disciples that he had. Even though they could be stunningly hard-headed and hard-hearted, even though they could act in stunningly selfish ways, even though they didn't seem to understand the nature of his mission or the shape and extent of his kingdom, even though their faith and actions were all questionable. So even though our reading of the call of Matthew distinguishes between Jesus' disciples and the tax collectors and sinners, the distinction was functionally questionable. All right, that's who Jesus deals with. Does he deal with the people who have their acts together? He calls us from mending our nets, from counting our shares of tax, taxes collected for the oppressive power. That's where, that's where Matthew comes. He calls each and every one of us from the mess of our lives. Jesus, in his own words, doesn't call those who are well because they don't need him. We can admit that we need him, and that is, that's, that's, the, that's, that's, the, that's the starting place that really uh, Jesus is hoping for, because at, at, as, soon as, as soon as we're open at that place, Jesus can work with us. There's something that can happen. And, and I'm going to say, in the very difficult discussion, uh, remember, it was awkward to describe the difference between what adultery was for men versus women. Can I also say there is an awkwardness when I describe the sexual problems in the heterosexual world versus the homosexual world? We make allowances for the heterosexual world. Divorce and remarriage. We bend over backwards to be inclusive in spite of six passages that state if a man puts away his wife and takes on another, he commits adultery. We bend over backwards because we're compassionate people, to find some way, because we know what's going on in people's lives and the mess and the hurt and the pain and the anguish and often the innocence, but even the guilt. We're still trying to make things work, are we not? And we do it for the heterosexual world, and our motive is compassion. Because at that place, we're acting like Jesus. Now, this is a world, it's a small percentage, that wants to be a part of us. And they don't fit the paradigm. I hold that the pertinent texts do not actually describe or refer to our LGBTQ companions and their circumstances and motives in expressly clear ways. We can't hold them responsible for the Greek nor the Jewish world's problems. We have to walk side by side with everyone, listening carefully to their story, working with them to discern what a moral life for them would look like, and it might look differently than ours. In everything, we have to look not only to the teachings of the scriptures, which in this case don't seem to answer our questions, but also to the example of Jesus who welcomed everybody and delighted almost in making his contemporaries uncomfortable. So if you welcomed people in here that made everyone else uncomfortable, you're acting like Jesus. Mm-hmm. That's what you're doing. And they might actually be asked, members of the LGBTQ community, why are you eating with them? That's what they might be asked by their companions. I, I, would, I have a lifelong friend. Uh, we, uh, my mom babysat him when we were babies. I've known him all of my life. He moved to San Francisco. He has a male lover. They invited me to the Christmas party, and I went when I was a doctoral student up in the GTU. And I was introduced as his cousin, because he always called my mom and dad uh, Uncle Joe and Annie Fran. And I was introduced as his cousin, Father Patrick. Everyone else in the room was gay. It was one of those interesting moments were done to me that I was the leper. <laughs> <laughs> they couldn't have been more loving. Why? Because they loved Arthur. This is difficult, but the way I have always understood it, the way it makes 
experienced in my day is some are born with brown eyes, some are born with blue eyes. You don't have a choice. Exactly. So I'm thinking, they don't have a choice. So I, I don't have a choice. God made me the way I am. God made them the way they are. God says, love your fellow man or woman. Yeah. Do you, you know, the, the clearest evidence I think that you are right, the clearest evidence I can think of that you are right is the whole, you've heard of reparative therapy? Re reparative therapy. It was developed by a man here in Los Angeles, a psychologist here, Joe Nicolosi here in Los Angeles, in which he claimed he could cure people. And when pushed to, as to what that cure meant, he's the man who developed the whole line of, of taking people who are gay and turning them straight. What he said was, well, you know, uh, in therapy, there, some of them are going to be able to reach a place where they can marry and have children. But they will always need to be, have therapy, and they will have failures for the rest of their life. That was the founder's description. You can read it. It's in Newsweek. I think I've got the footnote in your... In, uh, you can look it up online, okay? Um, Joe Nicolosi, that, the founder of reparative therapy, uh, uh, saying, you know, <laughs> they're going to need therapy for the rest of their lives, and they're going to fumble, and, you know, and that's his cure. What does that say? Is that a cure? It's certainly a good income stream for him. Is there going to be therapy for the rest of their lives? Mm -hmm. So, yes, apparently, when the therapist cannot cure, it's because, and, and people are going to, because they want to be cured, and can't, and can't. So, absolutely nothing. So uh, the question was, what did Jesus say on the question of same-sex relationships? And the answer to that is absolutely nothing. Was that was that your point enough? Yeah. Okay. Absolutely nothing. Uh, but, but please notice, Jesus doesn't spend anywhere near as much time on sex as the rest of us. It's not, it's, it's not his focus. If we have made it the focus, that's our problem. And I think it is our problem. It is our, it is, it, it's our problem. Yeah. Uh, I think of that woman caught in adultery. He does, he does say, you know, go sin no more. But good heavens, could he have been more compassionate to her? And he specifically makes it clear he does not condemn her. And he defends her. And he doesn't go after her first. He goes after the people who are all obsessed with the whole thing. That's who he goes after. So that's, that's his behavior on the whole question of sexuality. <laughs>